Welcome. Thanks for being with us, guys. OK, so this conference is a view from the top, Titans of Investing. I want to hear where you guys are deploying your capital, your view of the economy. But first, can I get a brief overview of the scope of GIC? And then I think everyone knows what Blackstone is, but give us a quick you know, view of, um, of your, the scope of your business. Why don't you start, Eric? Yeah, happy to. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, by the way. Thanks for inviting us. John, always a pleasure. Um, so GIC, as I think many folks know, is the sovereign wealth fund for the country of Singapore. So you could think of it almost like an endowment, but for a country. And so we do a couple of things, but a lot of it is really social work in the country. So we support a big part of the country's budget to pay for things like education, infrastructure, healthcare. And then we also serve as a rainy day fund for the country. So if you go back three years ago during COVID, there were about $50 billion drawn down on GIC's reserves, as well as the reserves of our sister organizations to help pay for healthcare, to help pay to stimulate the economy and keep things running in the country. So perhaps in another country that might have been deficit spending, but in that country they'd saved up the money to be able to draw down on those reserves for that kind of scenario. If you look at our portfolio, it's a global portfolio, so we really think about investing in most geographies in the world. We've got 11 offices with 2,300 people across five continents. And so that idea of having local teams who can underwrite things, even though it's a big global organization, is critically important to how we think about investing. Separately, we're really diversified. It's like the only free lunch in investing. Um, and so we invest in everything from sovereign bonds all the way through to venture capital, and really everything in between, with a bit of an overweight to private markets. So we have big private equity and real estate and infrastructure businesses that are important return drivers in that portfolio. And then I guess the last thing I'd say is that we do really have an almost permanent pool of capital, and it's a single pool of capital, which makes our life quite easy. So we're really trying to manage that portfolio for the long term. It allows us to make some decisions to invest in assets for a long period of time, or invest behind macro themes that we think will take a while to play out. And we're very focused on finding partners with whom we can do business, whether it's companies, families, corporations, management teams, who also have that long-term mindset to really be able to drive long-term value in companies. Great. We're the largest alternative asset manager in the world. Uh, GIC is a terrific partner of ours real estate, private equity, infrastructure, credit, um, you name it. Uh, and uh, I'm excited to be here, Matt. So I'll leave it at that. Awesome. Thanks, John. Why don't we start with you in terms of your view of the economy right now, inflation, you know, view on potential recession? Sure. I, you know, maybe I'll start with a little bit of optimism. Um, I think the inflation is increasingly moving to the rear view mirror. Um, if you look across our portfolio, what we're seeing is input costs coming down, shipping costs have come down dramatically. Labor has been stickier, but it's moved from sort of seven to five and a half percent, and our forward indicators say it's going lower. And if you look at CPI, um, what you see there is if you stripped out shelter costs, it would be as low as 3.4 percent last month. So I think that's a real positive for all of us as investors. The second positive, I would say, is the economic resilience we've seen in the United States. Um, our company's revenues have been growing nicely, double digits in the first quarter. Um, we've seen very little in the way of defaults in our corporate credit portfolio. And commercial real estate, which has gotten a lot of attention away from office buildings, has actually held up pretty well. So I think of it as generally a pretty good picture today. I think the challenge is all about the cost of capital going forward and the availability of capital. And I take the Fed at its word that it's going to keep rates elevated for an extended period of time. Um, and what we've seen in the regional banking system, I think, will lead to less capital availability. So that combination of higher cost capital, less capital available, we think will lead to a sequential slowdown. But right now on the ground, things are still pretty good. Eric, how about you? I guess I'd take a little bit longer term view. So I think we all remember over the last 40 years, interest rates have done nothing but go down, which has had all kinds of beneficial impacts, both for the operating companies that we invest in, as well as for the kinds of rates that you can sell companies for. I think that that period is over. Obviously, rates are up 500 basis points in the last year. John, I take your point. The economy is held in there better, far better, I think, than most anyone would have forecast a year ago. But that said, there are some big macro headwinds. If I look at the decoupling with China, if we look at the disruption in energy supplies given and food that's going on in the Ukraine and, and Russia. And so I think it's going to be, hopefully, hopefully you're right, we can get through this period without it being too painful. But there's a reasonable case scenario that we may have a, a I would say, a mild recession coming here. 
in the next one to two years? I, I, look, I'm in the camp definitely we're going to see a sequential slowdown, but it's just not happening nearly as fast as people had anticipated. I agree with that. And no, I would say this. I'm sure you're seeing it in your portfolio. If you look at our portfolio companies, they clearly have been able to both protect their labor forces, protect their margins, protect their profitability. Um, there is an impact on what companies are worth. Valuations have come down. But regardless, the companies right now are holding up well. Let's talk about where you guys are deploying capital. So, John, um, you mentioned regional banks. Um, I know private credit is a huge area for you. Where are you guys deploying capital right now? Well, I think, Matt, there's no question that credit is quite attractive. And the reason it's attractive is because the Fed's taken the cost of capital up 500 bips, and spreads have gone up as well. And so in many cases, you can get double-digit returns lending money in the senior half of the capital structure. So I would say whenever you can get equity-like returns, taking debt-like risks, that's something you should do. So we're definitely in the camp of private credit's attractive. I think there are sectors in the public markets where the sentiment is pretty negative, um, but the underlying businesses are maybe better than the perception. So um, we privatized uh, a tech company that was taken public in a SPAC an online event management business. It's a space we like a lot, but the sector for some of these, these companies, particularly the SPACs, has been pretty negative. Um, real estate, which I mentioned, the sentiment um, is very negative. Things are very tough for office buildings. Other categories of real estate better. That creates some opportunity. And I would say generally in an environment like this, providing the liquidity to people is very valuable. So buying secondaries in um, funds. Many pension funds are over allocated to alternatives. They're looking for liquidity. Many sponsors who own businesses need to deleverage because of the increased cost of capital. We have a business called Tactical Opportunities that can provide that kind of flexible capital. So the interesting thing I'd say is investors often get cautious in periods of the, like this. They're super enthusiastic in 2000 and 07 and 2021 when actually the risk is the highest. It's now when the uncertainty goes up, but the prices come down, debt capital is less available, that's when you want to lean in. It's almost like skiing down a hill. Your natural thing is to lean back, but when there's better opportunity, you want to lean into it. You can't wait for the all clear sign. You, you mentioned private credit. Should we be worried that there's like a bubble forming at all in, in private credit? There's a huge amount of enthusiasm there. You know, I, I don't think so. I, I think, you know, if you think about what's happening at financial institutions pulling back, that's creating, a, in some cases, real opportunity. Also, if you look at private credit as a percentage of the overall credit market, it's still very small. And the way I would think about private credit is if you think about private equity, which grew up over the last 30 years to take a meaningful chunk of pension funds allocations to equities. They went from public equity to private equity. If you looked on the fixed income side of the ledger, you would see that most institutions have almost all just liquid fixed income. And yet there's an opportunity for them to do some private origination, asset-backed finance, real estate, corporate direct lending, and earn additional spread by trading away some liquidity for higher rates of return. So I think we're early days. And in terms of is there a bubble, what you look at is what are the loan to values people are lending at? What's the pricing? And the loan to values actually come down, so it's not aggressive leverage, and the pricing's widened. So if anything, I would argue the opportunity is much bigger for private credit. And I think you'll continue to see pension funds, insurance companies, and individual investors migrate this way. So Eric, uh, where are you? Uh, where are the best opportunities for you? Well, it's interesting, invest? Matt. Um, as a, as a long-term investor, we really think we're purpose-built for this kind of environment. You wait a long time for pricing to come down a little bit, for there to be a little bit more slack and demand for assets so that you can really look for those great businesses that you've always wanted to own. Um, I think there are a couple of big, so I would say simply, we continue to invest across the cycle trying to find the best businesses that we can find. But I'd also say in this environment, there are a couple of long-term macro themes that we are investing behind. One clearly has been technology, which we've been leaning into for the last 10 years, and really for a couple of reasons. When I say you're looking for great business, you want a business that has the ability to grow long term. It has great returns on invested capital, and God bless if you can have some moats around it so it can actually protect that engine. And many of those look like many of the software companies, for example, that we own in the portfolio. Um, that will persist. Obviously, we've talked about AI today. We've talk we'll keep talking about it as a society, I'm sure, for the next five years. Um, 
Secondly, we are focused on climate opportunities. There clearly is a climate, um, a huge investment in climate that's happening today. Uh, in particular in the U.S. with the passage of the IRA, there is significant support behind this sector. And we see it as a space where you can generate reasonable rates of return. I don't think you're going to raise the money you need if you don't generate reasonable returns. It's hard to make it concessionary just given the scale of what's got to happen. And so we think in that space there is a real opportunity for us to deploy capital over a long time. Um, but the third one that's, that's today is clearly the private credit that John's talking about. For, for all the reasons that he raises, the opportunities and the spreads, and frankly, the credit underwriting that's going on in these businesses is just better than it was a year ago. And so if I were looking for one area where your relative risk reward between uh, an asset class and equity has converged a lot in the last year, that clearly would be it. So you kind of have an insider's view of uh, China, or Asia, I should say. <laughs> So uh, are you investing in, you know, what's your thoughts on China and greater Asia? Yeah, it's a good question. So as I said, we've got 11 offices all over the world. Um, so we've got two offices in China, we've got two offices in the US, Brazil, Korea, Japan, et cetera. Um, the first two offices we opened overseas were actually in the US. So our two offices here are 40 years old, almost as old as the firm. And the US accounts for almost 40% of the portfolio. So this is by far the biggest place that we invest. It's our most important market. I think China has been a bit of an enigma. Um, I think from a geopolitical standpoint, what we think about, because we really underwrite things here on the ground, is what are the inflation impacts of a decoupling with China? Is there some geopolitical uncertainty that may impact the assets that we own here? From an investment in China's standpoint, that's really driven by our teams there. But I know as they look at a government that's been a little bit more erratic in some of their decisions, it's harder to invest um, as confidently in that market. It's gotten more challenging. John, you were just over in Australia. I got a view of Asia. What's your, um, what's Flaxone's view on it, China, Asia? Well, I would say generally a couple things on Asia. Um, long term, the whole region will grow at a higher rate. So that means you want to be deployed there. Second thing I'd say is they had not only in China, but across the region, much more conservative policies on COVID. So they're coming out of this more slowly. So there's a little more of a kick left. Um, Intra-regional travel is definitely lagging. And we think it's going to pick up in a pretty big way. We own Crown Resorts, which is the biggest casino and hotel company in Australia. Um, we are big believers, I'd add to Eric's trend, travel and leisure, something we really like. Um, I would say India, which has been the biggest part of the, the region for us investing, is coming into its own in a big way. You have a government there who's oriented towards growth. You're clearly seeing companies looking to diversify a little bit. They want to have, in some cases, a China plus one strategy. Um, and so we see in India, both in real estate and private equity, uh, a lot of opportunity, particularly playing what is a rising middle class. So I think it's a region you want to be ex uh, exposed to. The geopolitical dynamic does make some of this a little bit harder. Um, but overall, we're spending more time. We're continuing to grow our business there. Great. We, we just mentioned artificial intelligence. So um, are we getting ahead of ourselves? I mean, I think NVIDIA is selling at 37 times sales right now. What, what are you, is it a game changer for you guys? I think it's a pretty seismic shift to how, how business will operate, how we'll live our lives. It's not gonna happen, obviously, all at once. Um, sometimes, in terms of valuations, things move very quickly. But if you went back to 1999, yes, the internet valuations in many cases didn't make sense, but the ultimate impact of the internet was pretty seismic, right? I think here, what we're trying to do is figure out what is it gonna mean for companies we're already invested in, and what does it mean for the future dollars we deploy? And what are, we've already got a team of 50 data scientists who we use inside our companies and also uh, at Blackstone when we're investing new capital. This is taking it a step further. We're, we're creating our own sort of white uh, label chat GPT with the idea that we have all this proprietary data. Can we create some insights off of that data? And I would say it's defense and offense. Are there businesses that are lower value add? Let's think of a call center or something that are more vulnerable. Are there even businesses and things like content where the machines might be able to do things either to replace humans or augment them? And then on the offensive side, what kind of businesses, what processes can we make better, more efficient, and what kind of businesses are going to win? You know, we have seen a step function increase in demand for data centers. Why? Because the big hyperscalers are saying, wow, I need this. 
And so all of a sudden that world has changed. And oftentimes in these trends, it's not about investing directly in the one thing that everybody sees. It's something one derivative off. So we own $200 billion of warehouses around the world, logistics. It's basically been a giant 15-year bet on e-commerce, which has just been up and to the right. And so the questions will be around AI, not only what directly will win, what companies will be impacted, but what are things just adjacent to it that'll have that same tailwind? Eric, how about you? You know, it's interesting. We, uh, every year we host a conference hosted by our venture team. We call it our Bridge Forum. And the idea is we bring in a couple of hundred of our venture capital companies that we're invested in, as well as some big, well-established Fortune 100, Fortune 500 companies to trade ideas. So the VC companies can meet with each other, uh, share ideas, see if there are ways to collaborate. And as much as that, for the more mature companies to meet some of these up-and-coming technologies and see if there are ways that they should change their business or consider using, utilizing some of these businesses. Um, th th this was just a couple weeks ago. The clear theme was AI. It was intended to be enterprise software, but it became an AI conference. Um, and there were so many data points that were fascinating. But for me, one of the biggest takeaways was people really don't know where it's going. Um, even the people who are very much in the driver's seat driving this stuff don't know where it's going. They would make the point they would say, look, the compute power now is 10 billion times what it was 10 years ago. So it's increasing by about 10x every year. And that's with the amount of investment that's going up, continuing to go exponentially right now. So if you think these machines have gone from being able to fail the LSAT six months ago to get a 90th percentile on the LSAT today, in six months it's going to be 99.9. .9, and from there, we don't know where it's going to go. So really, you think about the power of these tools, I don't think we've ever seen anything that's been as explosive. For us in our business, clearly we've taken the same approach that you have, both thinking offensively and defensively in terms of our existing investments, but also new investments. Within GIC itself, and I think probably within many of your organizations, trying to be creative about how you're using these tools is going to be critically important and probably faster than you think. So we're the same. We've rolled out chat GIC to all the GIC employees. People are busy experimenting with it. We've got our data science team building tools around it for sourcing and deal evaluation and data, uh, if you've got a data room, consolidation of information, even beginning to think about, and this has not happened yet, it will be a while, whether we can add an auxiliary member to our investment committees that's a, a, a large language model based interpreter of all the things that we're looking at just to keep us honest as we're thinking about things. I think it's gonna be very game changing. So we're basically out of time, but I'm slipping in one more question. What's keeping you, is there anything that's keeping you up at night? Is there anything that's really worrying you? Commercial real estate, interest rates? Look, I think the, um, I'm hopeful that some of the geopolitical tensions will cool. Uh, um, unfortunately, the situation in Ukraine doesn't seem to be coming towards an end near term, but I'm hopeful at some point it will. I, I think, um, you know, the challenge is as the economy decelerates, how far w will it go down, I think might be the, the bigger risk out there. But that said, I don't see the kind of imbalances we saw back in 08, 09, where we had massive over leverage in housing, commercial real estate, and financial institutions. So I think we have to anticipate a bit of a slowdown. Um, but I, I, I think this will end up being not quite as bad as some f folks have forecast. Agreed. How about you, Eric? I mean, I'm, I'm paranoid, like I'm sure many of you, so I worry about every, everything. Um, I think there are some of the obvious ones out there, and then there are these sort of the gray swan events, whether it's AI or climate or some of the geopolitics where, you know, you don't know what could happen, but you can imagine bad scenarios taking place. I think it's hard to focus too much energy there because of the probability, but they definitely are ones that would have catastrophic impacts on all of our investing worlds. Um, I do think the biggest one that's most tangible is thinking about what the timeline is, uh, whether there's a recession, how long rates need to stay, hot, stay high. If we have companies that we already own, where the capital structure, I might prefer it to have been more hedged a year ago, but it's less hedged in terms of interest rates. So rates might go up and some of these companies might be struggling to, to bear that burden. We don't see it yet. Everything looks quite healthy, but if I'm looking around the corner, that might be a risk. I will say one of the opportunities there is there could be a large distress cycle. I don't think it's probable, but there could be for the first time maybe in the last 10 years. And so thinking about how to position yourself for that kind of opportunity would be one that I would just keep an eye on and see if that's a way that you might be able to help soothe some of the pain as you, if that process does come to pass. Cool. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you.